Hola YouTubers, Mama D here. We're going to pick up where we left off on the last Can We Talk here. This is going to be part two. We're going to get right to it. In this portion, we're going to discuss what we didn't get to last time for lack of time, and that was demonic possession. Now, when I first became born again, I still had demons that did not want to let go of me. They did not want to uh, get out. Now, Satan was not going to give up on me so easily after being in the occult for 25 years. He uh, was not going to let go without a fight. Now, um, I want to remind people of the scripture where uh, the Lord says, uh, or where scripture says that once we are the Lord's that no one can snatch us out of his hand. So when I became born again, I became one of those people that the Lord was not going to let anyone snatch out of his hand and I'm so grateful <laughs> that he felt that way <laughs> because it helped me to endure the attacks from Satan and his demons now uh, Satan came to me often in dreams and visions trying to talk me into coming back to the occult. Each time I would tell him no, he would get angry, he would disappear until the next time. Now my first church in Dallas where I was born again, I went through a lot of frustration and I'm sure a lot of believers go through that because um, there isn't anything that we can do to learn how to get on track or to flow into the mainstream of the present uh, congregation. I mean, they're so far uh, ahead of you sometimes. As a new believer, you feel lost. You feel ostracized, like, what do I do now? Where do I go? How do I learn? And there's no one around to answer any of these questions. So I'm going to share with you some things to pass on what I have learned, and hopefully it will be uh, advantageous to you. Now one would be wise to listen to what I'm saying. I am speaking from experience so I do know what I am talking about here and uh, even if there's no demonic activity in your life right now, mark my word the day is coming when you will be faced with this situation and may not know what to do about it. Now this past Sunday my pastor uh, gave the most awesome message on casting out demons. And I thought that was, uh, the timing was so appropriate because we've been doing videos on this. And I just thought that um, it is just so great the way the Lord moves sometimes that He just speaks to uh, pastors sometimes with about things that people in in the body of Christ are going through or things that are being worked on and they kind of coincide and go together so I was very blessed with his message on Sunday and uh, he brought out important key factors that every believer must know and I would kind of like to do uh, the same thing with this video there's a lot of stuff that wasn't mentioned but I'm sure it was because of lack of time because the presentation he gave was very awesome and very informative to those who have not uh, had the opportunity or do not have the ability to cast out demons because this is a gift you guys it's not uh, something that everyone can do this is a gift God calls uh, specific people to be able to deliver, do deliverance ministry as far as casting out demons go. Now, uh, as, as I was saying, uh, when I became born again, I thought that those voices, those demons, uh, would flee right out of me, but it didn't happen like that. It was only peaceful for a while. And then uh, I would hear the voices again. I would have the dreams and nightmares again. Then all hell broke loose and I kept hearing them uh, trying to scare me, intimidate me. And 
I have very dark circles under my eyes for lack of sleep, and this went on for months. But then one day, Pastor Mike, uh, who was my pastor at that time, uh, announced that this little man from Africa called Bishop Tudor was coming to uh, his church, and he was an expert on deliverance ministry. Uh, I believe he claimed that this man had actually brought someone back from the dead. I'm not sure. It's been so long, 1998, I don't remember all the details. But I do know that this man had the gift and the calling for deliverance. Now, uh, there was a lot of people there. He was there for like three or four nights. And everybody wanted him, of course. To pray for them especially me I felt like that woman in the in the scripture where uh, she had the issue of blood and she tried to get to Jesus and she just knew in her heart that uh, if she touched him that she would be healed well I didn't know that scripture at that time but um, now that I know the scripture I felt the very same way that woman did I really and truly believe that if Bishop Tudor laid hands on me that those demons would uh, fly out of me. So I didn't get to go up for prayer because they had no altar calls. So you know I just accepted that uh, those suckers were going to be with me forever because I didn't know any better at the time. But what happened was after the last service there were several people at the altar standing around talking about what had happened and how great it had been and Bishop Tudor was talking with Pastor Mike on the stage. Now I was facing the stage and he was facing the audience so while I was talking to this woman I happened to look back at him and the and Pastor Mike and it was like he was looking right at me and uh, before I knew what was happening he was he walked away from Pastor Mike who was still in mid-sentence talking to him but he just walked off started pushing his way through the crowd that was on the stage he jumped off the stage pushed through that crowd as well and came right at me uh, let me tell you, it's, it scared me for a minute because I didn't know if he was going to smack me or what or what he was going to do. But one thing for sure that I did know in my spirit was this man knew that those demons were on the inside of me. He saw it from the stage. He uh, felt it. Whatever uh, adjective you want to use, he, he knew that that those guys were there so he came at me and he grabbed my my head with both of his hands and uh, as soon as he did that the anointing on this man was so strong that I immediately fell to the ground he started speaking in tongues and and casting out the demons, speaking in English, commanding them to leave. I mean, he was doing everything that since then I have learned to do myself. But um, he was doing all these things. And all I could do was cry. And, and, and that's what I felt. I don't know if there were tears of happiness or what was going on. I just knew that that he was the answer to my prayer. Amen. Now, um, I was on the ground. He was casting out demons. And suddenly, I felt this big push in the middle of my chest. Uh, and I guess that's where your soul is. I don't know. But I felt this, this heavy push down on my chest. And then it was like, like I was lifted up like an invisible string was lifting me up and like it tore out of me just like you what was that movie um uh, aliens remember that movie aliens that's how it that's how it felt when the thing just burst out of your chest but there was no actual wound there you know it was all spiritual 
Now, I felt when those things came out of my body, and uh, I, I really started crying when that happened, and uh, I opened my eyes, and that little man, <laughs> oh, God, God bless you, Bishop, if you ever get a hold of this video, but I am so grateful to you. But uh, that little man was staring me right in the face. He, it was like he was right on top of my face, and his eyes were just like so powerful. And he was just looking in my eyes real intense like he was looking for more demons or something, but uh, I saw his eyes relax, and I guess he didn't see anymore, and uh, I was just crying. I, w I was just happy. I, I felt those things leave, and I was just overjoyed, and uh, he helped me up, and he said, you're clean now, and I just looked at him, because I didn't know all the church lingo, so I just nodded yes. And he said, you're going to do great work for the Lord one day. So praise God that that statement made me very happy. And for all I know, what I'm doing now, maybe what he was referring to, maybe not. Either way, um, I was so full of joy and thankful to the Lord for what had happened. But after that, those guys were gone. And my I didn't hear the voices anymore. I could sleep. But I still had visitations from Satan in dreams and visions. He kept trying to get me to come back to the occult. Now, the funny thing is, at that time, I didn't know about Luke 11, 24, 26. This scripture describes exactly what happened in my case. And I want to give a heads up to any pastors who may come across my videos, especially this one. Um, after being in the occult for so many years, and I became born again, I understand now that with this scripture, my house was swept clean and put in order. But because there was no follow-up as to what I was supposed to do after that, like read my Bible, learn scripture, uh, make effort to uh, get teaching in the Word and, and the way of God, in addition to attending the regular church services. I think had I had those things available to me, I, I would have filled my house back up and my house would not have been empty when uh, the demons came back and took possession again because the house was empty. But had I had the teaching and all that other stuff on the inside of me, I don't think that they would have been able to come back. And I think new believers are neglected once they receive salvation. We tend to forget about them. And I think that's the most dangerous, uh, dangerous time for a new believer to be left alone and unguarded and uncared for. So if any of you guys are out there listening, I hope that something will be put in place to protect the new believers, to get them going like a crash course so that they'll be able to flow into the mainstream of the body of Christ who are more spiritually advanced than they are. So just something to get them started, get them going so that their house doesn't remain empty, the demons don't come back, where, wherefore they, they get convinced by friends and other unbelievers that nothing happened, that they're not different, that they really didn't accept salvation. Amen? Now, um, I want to talk about unspirit, unclean spirits, demons always waiting to enter your body. I know it sounds funny and we laugh and joke around about this a lot, 
but uh, this is true. This is something that really happens. And the reason we're not familiar with it, because we're talking about the spirit world here, you guys. We're not talking about um, going downtown shopping and actually seeing with the naked eye what you're buying or what you don't want, what you do want. We're talking about the spiritual world here. This is another dimension. This is something that is, that is invisible to the naked eye and you can't see. Now, if any of you saw the movie Ghost, when the spirit entered into the woman's body, it's just like that. Spirits are hanging around in the spirit world, drifting around. They're drawn to your life force, the light. And they're just waiting for that life force to go out for whatever reason, whether it's sin, whether it's near-death experience, um, whatever the, the, the reason that they're able to take possession of your body. They're waiting. They have all the time in eternity to wait. So it, it does happen. And I just want you to know that, um, that this should be taken seriously. This thing about your life force, your aura. In the Bible, it's referred to as your hedge of protection. So uh, these demons have names to you guys. Maybe you'll recognize some of them. Now, uh, I know this sounds far-fetched, but it would be to the, to the natural person, to the naked eye in this world, the physical world. But it's not so far-fetched in the spiritual world. But what I'm telling you is the truth. And I'm going somewhere with this, so you really, really have to pay close attention because you're going to be surprised how it all ties in together. Now, uh... You might recognize the names of some of these demons. And we're going to start with power, envy, anger, greed, gossip, vanity, drugs, drunkenness, lying, cheating, murder, rage, self-centeredness, adultery, godlessness, rebellion, idolatry, unclean lips, and the mama jama of them all, lust. Now, these are all demons. These are all the names of demons. All the unclean spirits that are flying around, hanging out, wait, waiting to possess a body, a soul. These spirits are real. Now, so, when I was practicing witchcraft many years ago, I knew before I could cast a spell on anyone, even Christians, I had to see one of these things that I just described to you before I could proceed. It was a rule. I knew when I saw one of these things visibly in someone's life that their hedge of protection was down because they were in sin. Their light was out. Whatever analogy you want to use, only then, only then, was I able to cast a spell on them or do what it was that I was going to do. I knew when they were not walking right and they were in sin that I could proceed. But when they were walking right and there was no visible sin in their life, I could not touch them. And if I tried, I would hear God say to me, so see... Hearing God's voice now is not something new in my life. I heard God's voice even then when I was practicing the occult. I would hear God say to me, You can't have them. They belong to me. So, I would just crawl in my hole and give up. But that was arrogance. But I knew even back then, how powerful God was and is today. So this kind of um, gives me a more clear understanding of the power of God now that I am a believer. And I believe this is one of the reasons why God has 
uh, given me the gift of uh, deliverance in my own life because I know my enemy. I used to be the enemy. So I believe that now that uh, I'm in God's light and he has accepted me as, as one of his kids, now I'm using that um, experience and knowledge for the good to help people. So trust me when I talk about these things, I do know what I'm talking about. And it's not arrogance and it's not pride. When I try to explain these things to you, I want you to get understanding. I want you to get comprehension of the enemy that you're facing. Amen? So, uh, let's move on with this. This is why I tell you over and over and over again, repent as soon as you sin. As soon as you know you missed the mark, repent. Now, you guys, some of you out there, you like to play games and uh, dilly-dally here and there. But you know what? You know when you sin. Come on, you know when you sin. You know when you hurt someone and you know when you do it deliberately. You know when you commit a wrong against a person. You know when you have done something wrong. Sometimes you want to find every excuse in the world as to why you did something, why you hurt someone, why you committed a wrong, why you did this or that and da 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 da. Forget the excuses. If you did something wrong, it's wrong. It's a sin. Regardless of your reasoning, regardless of your lame excuses, sin is sin. And that's how God is going to look at it. That's why you need to repent immediately. Believe me, it's arrogance. That's true arrogance and pride. When you feel that you have a good excuse and a good reason to hold anger, unforgiveness, and wrongdoing against a person and not have to repent. Now, in Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8, it reads, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Now, you must keep your hedge of protection intact. You need to repent of sin immediately. Now, this is, this is what I was talking about. Your life force that's around your body, your aura, whatever you want to call it, whatever verse you want to use uh, to describe that. There's a lot of poetry and stuff out there describing that. I like to refer to it as your life force. Now, when it goes out, them suckers are going to climb on in, so you don't want that to happen. Uh, now, take note, you guys. I just told you about the very same things that God warns us of in Scripture. So, just so that you know that there is a parallel with what I am saying to you and what is written in Scripture. So, um, I'm going through all this detail with you so that the Scripture that I'm going to put you in remembrance of makes more sense to you. Now, there are the scriptures like Galatians 5, 18 through 21, where these very same names of these demons are listed. In Revelations 22, these same names of these demons are listed. And uh, remember when the Lord kicked out Lucifer and a third of the angels went with him. Okay. Um, these are the same names we find listed. Is anyone making the connection here? Does it make sense to you now? God cannot allow any demons back into heaven. 
He kicked them out once already. He doesn't want them back. He doesn't want them contaminating the heavens. Look, look what they did with the earth. It can't be that way. Heaven is holy. God is holy. He doesn't want them back there. Now, if these demons are possessing your soul and they're in you at the time of your death, guess what? You're not going to be allowed into heaven. You have a demon inside of you. God is not going to allow you back into heaven. And I'm even willing to go as far as to say you're going to go into that waiting place where um, where you don't you don't go directly to hell but there's a waiting place for believers who die with unrepentant sin in their life but the only time that you're going to see the Lord is when you go before the great white throne judgment you're not going to see absent from the body, present with the Lord. The only time you will go before the Lord is for the great white throat judgment where he will decide what to do with you. Amen. So we're going to stop here and talk some more later. Okay. God bless you. Bye-bye.